Good to be with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open up to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We are coming to close to the end of our series we've done on the parables for the last few weeks. I hope that this has been a blessing to you. The aim of this is to look and has been to look through probably Jesus' most used vehicle to teach and pull out maybe some, some different interpretations of this than we've looked at in the past. Right, and that's, that's been my aim every week is to, to look at the way Jesus is teaching. And I've given you this example of, and definition for how do we interpret parables, right? They're not, they're not fables. They're not kids' stories. They are spiritual teaching that is just utilizing easier to understand imagery to help us take the, the, the principle away. Parables are stories that allow us to see reality the way God sees it. We've looked at some of the most well-known parables. We've looked at a few less known. And today, we're going to look at one that's kind of right in the middle. And again, we're we're coming to the the close of this. Next week, our family will be gone. Logan is going to wrap us up looking at uh, maybe one of the most well-known. And we'll end on that. But today, we're going to look at the parable of the rich fool. And I appreciate Matt reading out of Ecclesiastes because... That's going to tie directly, and if anybody can understand the application of the rich fool, it would have been Solomon, right? Solomon had it all and ultimately pointed to the folly of it. But we've done a series on money this year, and and what my hope for us and my challenge for us is to look at the parable of the rich fool, and like most often, not to say that the Bible doesn't touch on money, because it does a lot, but more often than not, the money doesn't just mean the money. Right, it, 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 Money is one application that we could have used, and we just did, like I said, we did a series on, on money not that long ago, and my challenge to you then was not to just think of it in terms of physical wealth, but priority. Where do we place what matters? Where do we place our time and our resource? And money does fall in that category. And I'm going to give you a similar challenge this morning as we look at the parable of the rich fool. This is one, again, Jesus is pointing to, and he's talking to He gets a question. This is one of those parables um, that he gets a question and then he begins to answer it with a parable back. So let's read Luke 12, and we're going to start in verse 13 and read down through verse 21. And I encourage you, as you listen to this, again, think back to Ecclesiastes 5, what Matt just read for us, because they're going to really go hand in hand in many ways. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, you made me a judge or an arbiter over you. And he said, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his things. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. Now I want to make, I want to pause really quick. I want you to listen to the profile of the rich man. I want you to listen to the way Jesus describes the rich man. And, and I'm going to ask this question again. This is rhetorical, but I want you to think about this. I want you to think, and I want you to read, does the, para, does the, the, the man that's described here sound like a fool? Does the man that's about to be described sound like he's done anything wrong based on every standard that the world would look at and say, this is good, this is productive, this is what it means to live a successful life? I want you to listen to the profile. And then I want you to listen to the way God responds via Christ. Listen to this. He told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he said to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Some versions say my abundance of crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, those will they be. So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. I want you to listen to that profile of the rich man. And this morning, we're going to do a pretty simple lesson. In fact, there's only two points, but the second one I want to spend a lot of time on. We're going to look at through the parable of the rich fool. Number one, don't mistake your time in this life for eternity. Let me repeat that. 
our life on this side of eternity can have a lot of great things about it. And, and it's hard for us to imagine eternity because we think of our lives and it seems relatively long. But don't mistake this side of eternity for the next. Don't mistake the material for the spiritual. Let's look in Luke 12 and let's reread 19 through verse 20. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Again, I ask you to look at the profile of this man. He's prepared, right? He's rich. He's clearly a businessman. He's a farmer. Everything has gone right. And all he's doing is preparing for the future, right? He says, I've got plenty to rest on, right? We talk about resting on our laurels. This may be the biblical example of that, right? We've got enough. I've done it right before. So now I get to relax. Anything wrong with that? But listen to this. He says, I've got plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared? The irony. And so many times the parables rely on irony and and we look at this, and the irony of the rich fool is he's talking about all this preparation that he assumed that he had years and years and years. And God says, not only do you not have years, you don't have hours. And what all the things you think that you're going to rest on, all the things that you've built up, what are they going to matter? Solomon talks about it a lot in Ecclesiastes, and I've, I've given you this pitch before. Ecclesiastes is, is essentially a, a journal that Solomon wrote towards the end of his life after squandering resource and money and had done everything wrong. And he comes back to the end and says, and again, he was probably billions of dollars. He says, I can't take any of this with me. It doesn't matter how much I've built. By the time when I go back into the ground, that's it. The rich man points to the same thing. And Jesus talks via parable about this. Proverbs 27 points us to a similar idea. It says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what the day may bring. I read it this way, and it stuck with me. Life isn't defined by tomorrow, but it's defined by today. The truth of the matter is, you and I aren't guaranteed the next minute, much less the next hour, much less the next day, week. But the truth is, is, if we all opened our calendars, and I'm as bad as any, the office staff will tell you I try to plan years in advance, knowing full well that not all that will come to fruition, but that's the way my mind works. And my guess is many of you are the same way. We open up our calendars, and we're years out. But the reality is, the very real reality is that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. But we make decisions, and we treat our life as if we have infinite run room to correct all the things that should be dealt with today. Life isn't defined by tomorrow, but it's defined by today. And this is where I want us to really spend the majority of our time with regards to the rich fool. We can be, we can be wise in the world's eyes and a fool to God. Let me rephrase that a moment. You and I can on the surface have it all figured out. And that's why I ask you to look at the profile of the rich fool. Anybody by today's standards that would look at this story and was just taking a tertiary glance of this would look and say, this guy's got it, right? He, he's clearly wealthy. He's planning for the future. He clearly made good decisions in the past that he's reaping the benefits of now. I mean, there are people in our world today that make careers based on this very thing. But then God looks at him and says, you fool. That is not what's going to matter in the end. He's got it all figured out based on the world's standards, but in God's eyes, he's a fool. How is that possible? We looked this morning in Matt's class, which was terrific, at the struggle, and we look at verses that seem to point one way, but we see that really they, they reconcile together. I want us to look at a similar idea. How? Do we reconcile all this as Christians? How do we move forward with this? Do we think that the rich man looks like a fool? Again, my guess, this is not wrong, my guess is most of you say no. Based, again, just a tertiary glance of this, we look down at this and we think, oh, everything I see is things that from a worldly perspective you and I aspire to. 
right? He's made great decisions in seems to be family and life and business and now he's come to the end of his career so to speak and he's going to rest on the laurels of what he's done that is that is in a in a sense what we all strive for but then we look at God's response and then we begin to question and that's what I want us to do this morning you know again we look at all the criteria and we look at all the things and we think By most accounts, he's got it figured out, right? He's not being wasteful. He says, what am I going to do with the excess that I have? Right, this is a great problem that every business owner hopes to have. I've got got excess resource. What am I going to do with this? Right, he plans. I'm going to put, I'm going to build bigger barns. He's beginning to save. He's preparing for the future. But again, people can look wise and successful in God's eyes and can look like a failure and a fool in the world's eyes. Let me repeat that. People can look wise and successful in God's eyes and they can look like a fool and a failure to the world. Where do we place our treasure? Where do we place our priority? 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 says, Don't deceive yourselves. If any of you, listen to this, if any of you think that you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Let me repeat that. The wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Now that's, again, this is... We've, our whole class on Sunday morning is regarding this. There's more to this story than just the few verses we're pulling out. But there's truth here nonetheless. Does that mean that everything that we look at on this world is complete foolishness? No. But where do we place the priority? What are we listening to? To go back to Matt's class, what are we listening to with regards to our standard? Right? Is the world our standard? Are we wanting to build the barns so that we can build up resource on this side of eternity? Or are we looking at heaven as the true goal? That we can struggle on this side of eternity and be a resounding success to God. And vice versa, we can kill it on this side of eternity and end up in hell. That's the reality. Don't deceive, and and again, I love the way Paul phrases this to the Corinthian church. He recognizes that this is counterculture. That's why he says, don't deceive yourselves. The way he's saying this is, I know you're hearing it differently. I know that the people, the peers in Corinth are telling you otherwise. I know you're hearing it differently, but don't deceive yourselves. The world's wisdom is foolishness. The wisdom of God is is where we begin to find success. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. The rich man, and this is where I'd like to spend the rest of our time, because again, we look at this, and by all definitions, we think this guy's got it figured out, but God tells him that he's a fool, so why? Why is somebody that seemingly has it together, why is God pointing him as a fool? I want to offer you just a few things. And again, this is a parable, so we're going to take a little bit of inference out of this, out of what we're reading. But I think it's got a scriptural backing as to why this man was called a fool. The rich man was a fool because he didn't give. I want you to, I want you to listen to the way he describes his circumstance. Again, this is a parable, so this is Jesus using real but a fictitious story to illustrate a spiritual principle. But he's talking about, he says, what am I going to do with my excess? He told them the parable. What shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? Really, the inference there is I have nowhere to store extra, right? I've already got initial stores, but I've got so much extra, where am I going to put it? Right, we look at an Old Testament example in a moment. You know, the rich man, we look at his language here. In just a few verses, this is not a long parable, right? This is not the Good Samaritan. This is not the sower. This is a a kind of short to medium parable. And in a relatively short time, he says, I six times. Christ, of course, says I as him six times. And three times he uses my because it's all about him. What am I going to do with my resource? What am I going to do with my money? What am I going to do with my stuff? 
Go back to 2 Kings 6. This may seem like an odd place to go, but I want to illustrate a point. Because we're going to look at, and you might think the Bible doesn't talk about economics, and you'd be wrong. We're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 6, and we're going to get a very clear illustration of what the, the man, the rich fool in our parable is trying to do. Right, 2 Kings chapter 6. So the context of 2 Kings 6 is there was a tremendous famine. They had been at war. Food was low. Food was extremely low. Right? You and I understand the principle of supply and demand. We'll look at a graph of this in a moment. If you thought you escaped econ, you're wrong. You're getting econ in church today. So look at this. He said, there was a great famine in Samaria, and as they besieged it, listen to this, a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and the fourth part of a, a, a cab of, dove, of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. Now, we're going to fast forward one chapter to 2 Kings chapter 7. This is the prophet Elisha that's around at this moment, and God intervenes and provides a over an abundance of food, right? We don't have time to go into all the why, but God provides all this over an abundance. The very first verse of 2 Kings 7, Elisha replied, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says about this time tomorrow at Samaria's gate. Six quarts of fine flour will sell for half an ounce of silver. And 12 quarts of barley will sell for half an ounce of silver. We look at this, it's supply and demand. Right, the more I have, right, when, when supply is high, and demand, then we see prices begin to go down, right? When supply is low and demand is high, prices go up. Look back at our story in Luke chapter 12. Again, this is inference, but we're looking at, his question is not, what can I do with my extra? What can I do with my resource? How can I be a blessing to others? The, the thought for him is, let me store it up. Let me build bigger barns so that I can have all of the supply and I dictate what to do with it. The rich man was a fool because he didn't give. The rich man was a fool because he didn't plan for eternity. The rich man was called a fool by God because he didn't plan for eternity. I want to give you two quotes that came out of a commentary that I love that I think points us in the right direction here. He says, he, talking about the rich fool, thinks that he's a great long-term planner. And again, by our profile, by any standard of today's age, he was. Right? He had it all squared away. He thought he was a great long-term planner, but he was completely unprepared for the future. That's our irony that so often presents itself in parables. His earthly, temporal view ignored the spiritual and the eternal. Now, we could stop right there, and I would encourage you to highlight that, because so often we fall in that similar trap. We allow the earthly, the temporal view to, at best, kind of cause a fog to come over the temporal or to come over the spiritual, the eternal. But worst case, sometimes we forget the eternal altogether. He said he had goods laid up for many years and God says this night your soul is required of you. He didn't have years, he didn't have months, he didn't have weeks, he didn't even have days. He had hours. All the planning he thought he was doing was for nothing. This kept on going. It said, the rich fool got life and death wrong. He got life and death wrong. He got life wrong because he thought life consisted in the abundance of his possessions. But immediately before the parable of the rich fool, Jesus said one's life doesn't consist of the abundance of his things. He got death wrong because he thought his death was far away, but he wouldn't live to see another day. Where do we place our priority? Do we get life and death wrong? Do we define what matters incorrectly? Do we place a value on things and on stuff and on resource as opposed to looking at the eternal view? Which brings us to this point. The rich man was a fool because he wasn't rich towards God. That's the very end of this. The parable, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. What a great phrase 
Are we rich towards God? And that encompasses a lot of things, right? That's not just your money. That's not just your time. That's your life. That's everything. That is your being. Is, is, is your spirit rich towards God? Is your money rich towards God? Is your time rich towards God? You know, we look in Revelation chapter 2 and we see the, the, the John was writing to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And again, we see kind of profiles of churches here. And I want you to look at two different ones. We see in Revelation 2 and verse 9, Smyrna, which is a persecuted church. It was physically poor, but it was spiritually rich. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are wealthy or you are rich. Right, again, look at the dichotomy there. Look, look at the, we look at this and we think, why would that be the church that Christ is going to come in? Why would that be the church that God is going to look at and say, you're doing it right? Because by the earthly standards, they've got it all wrong. Right, they're poor, they're persecuted, they aren't, they don't have the, the options that others do. But he says, spiritually, you're rich. And then, not too far later, we look in Revelation 3 and we see Laodicea. Completely different profile. This is a congregation described as lukewarm, but it was physically well off. It was, it was physically rich. Physically, it had it going on. But it was spiritually poor. And he says, I am rich. You say, I am rich. I've become wealthy and I have need for nothing. Do you not know? Listen to this. Do you not know? that you're wretched, that you're poor, that you're blind, and you are naked. I'm going to suggest to you that the, the rich fool is the church at Laodicea. He thought that because physically he had it all squared away, that the spiritual was just going to follow suit. He thought that this was going to be enough to sustain him, but God both times tells the rich fool, he calls him, he says, you're a fool if you think that this is going to last. John, via the Spirit, describes Laodicea and he says, you think you've got it because you've got money? You think you are going to make it to heaven just because you're physically wealthy? Do you think that's going to matter? And he doesn't just stop there. He says, in fact, you aren't wealthy, you're poor, you're wretched, and maybe the most is you're blind. You're blind if you think this is going to matter. And he talks about them being lukewarm. Again, we look at the profile of this rich man. A little bit of inference here, but Christ could have pointed anything out. We have no record of him lying, cheating, stealing. He was diligent. He was hardworking. By all accounts, he obtained his wealth by, by moral good means. We look at this profile and we think, there's nothing wrong with this. But it points to the, the significance in God's eyes of where our priority is placed. It's not necessarily that God cares about wealth that much. It's not so much that he minds. There were plenty of Christians that were well off. Again, we've done a whole series on money. It's not that God minds money. But he recognizes that money gets in the way of our submission to him 9.9 .9 times out of 10. It's not that he minds us having things, but he says the only way I'm okay with that if all of that comes secondary to your relationship to me. If you can get that right, fine. That's why he gives warnings so often, just like the rich man. It's no matter how much wealth, and again, you sub in wealth for a lot of different things. It doesn't matter how much things how many jobs, how many titles, all the great things that we want to flaunt around on this side of eternity. It doesn't matter how much of that we accumulate. If we aren't rich towards God, we're poor. And not only are we poor, we're poor fools. The way that Laodicea is described, we're blind. Church, don't be blind. Don't be the poor fool that thinks we have it all squared away, but that spiritually we don't. Where's your wealth located? Where are you putting your things? We go back to Luke 12. The rich fool thought he had it. I've got, I need extra space to fill my crops. He said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones so that I can store all my grains and my good. And I'll say, soul, relax, relax. 
Church, don't relax. Don't relax. Our life is described as a vapor, right? We think, we think it takes so long, but in reality, our life is done. And where we spend eternity, and let me reiterate, I know you know this, but eternity, it means eternity. It means forever. It means the decisions we make today will determine will you spend forever, either with the creator in paradise or in torment. That's the option. Where's your wealth, where, where's your wealth located? This morning, if you aren't a Christian, we want to give you the opportunity to come and be submersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, to be baptized, to be added to the body of Christ so that your wealth is properly located. Because I'll, I'll repeat this again. There is so many examples, biblical and secular, of godly people that loved the Lord that, that struggled their entire lives on this side of eternity. But we know from Scripture that they're guaranteed their reward. Conversely, there are people, probably even more examples, that succeeded over and over and over. And we look sometimes and think, why? Why, why do they have it all together and I continue to struggle? But we know that those people don't always end up with a relationship with God and that's what matters. This morning, if you aren't a Christian, you have that opportunity. You aren't promised tomorrow, but you have today. If we can help you in any way, would you come forward and let us know about it as we stand and as we sing?